Katie Hill. Hello, Joe. Welcome to the podcast. This is, this is actually how we start every podcast. We open we open the drinks. Or every conversation, uh, too, uh, for that matter. Perfect, yeah. Uh, welcome, welcome to Charleston. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, First timer? First timer, yep. Okay, and uh, y'all were in town for just a couple nights. Went to uh, Leon's last night, had dinner there. Yep, yep. Give it good ratings. It was great, yeah, okay. loved it. Give the local beer good ratings as absolutely. well. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Big you fan. recommend Charleston to anyone? I 10 would out definitely. of 10 stars. Yep, 10, 10 out of 10. All right, good, good. Got that out of the way. <laughs> now, now we, were, we were talking on the way over here uh, earlier. So, four years ago to this day, tell us where you were. Four years ago to this day, I announced for running for Congress, and I was a 29 year old. I um, had no real political experience whatsoever. And um, I picked International Women's Day because honestly, what motivated me to run was the fact that Donald Trump had been elected president. And um, I felt like it was, the, well, there were many reasons that that was problematic. But um, I think as a woman in particular, it felt like just a slap in the face, you know, with Hillary Clinton losing to him. And, um, and so, you know, it's just crazy to think of what has happened over the last four years and where we are now and um, learned a lot. <laughs> there, there's a lot of, people like us that came in in the 116th Congress that had no political experience whatsoever, mm -hmm. but have similar stories yep. as you, like, you know, Trump was elected. I feel like we need checks and balances. I mean, because we went up there with a, I don't know how many folks came 60. in with us that, that did not have oh, any yeah. political experience whatsoever. I mean, there had to have been like 30 or 40 that had nothing, yeah. no political experience. So it was... And what kind of feedback do you get, like, when you decide to jump in? And w which was... Well, t talk about your, your district. I mean, it was, yeah. it was a red district, right? Yep. So my my district had been held by a Republican for 30 years. And um, it was, you know, it was changing. The district is changing. But when I decided to resign, I thought that the district, had, I won by nine points almost. And so I thought that the district was solidly, you know, it was, it was strong enough blue. Mm -hmm. Um, but then a Republican ended up winning in the special election and he won again in November. And, um, and so it shows you that the, the districts, even the ones that you think have moved enough are they're they're not secure. They're not ones that we can count on. Um, but yeah, so it was, you know, it was, it was one of those things where, my district was one that Hillary Clinton had won by seven, um, but the Democrat, the the Democratic nominee in the past time in 2016 lost, and um, it was it was listed from the very beginning as one of the most important districts to, for Democrats to be able to flip the House, and I found that out thinking like there's no way this I've known this district forever I didn't think a Democrat could ever take it, and um, finally it was like it, it basically someone was like. No, we can't, like I looked into it and and it was you know clear that we could actually flip the district. It was possible, um, but you needed the right candidate. And I know my hometown. Like I've I spent my whole life. What, what part of California is it's this? It's just north of of Los Angeles, so it's a yeah. suburb of Los Angeles. Um, yeah, a couple of kind of bedroom communities, and um, but we're very like this is our place, mm -hmm. right? And so you weren't going to be hyper local. Yep, and so you weren't going to be able to get somebody who kind of. Um, you know, came in to the district in order to run. That's just not something that would fly there. And um, so anyway, someone's, my dad's a cop, my mom's a nurse. That's like, you know, together, those are the two professions <laughs> that yeah, make yeah. up most of the community. Um, and I worked in the nonprofit sector and uh, it was, someone finally was like, you know what, you have like this perfect profile for the district, you should run. And I was like, me, no way. And then finally I was like, you know what, fine. And it was a total long shot campaign. Um, but it grew incredibly grassroots and we won, uh, as like this, you know, this long shot in the primary and then, um, you know, kept going. And, and, and then like, I think, uh, vice called your campaign, the most millennial campaign ever. Yeah. And, uh, and did you have a, was there a Netflix episode or, or no, it was, it was vice. It was did vice. A, vice did like a four part yeah. series on yeah. it. They yeah. Pass on our pitch, uh, to do something on our race. Oh, uh, bummer. Yeah. We yeah. didn't pitch I, it. I think you got it. Actually, yeah, we didn't so. pitch it. They found us, but I think they were originally just going to do like a 15 minute thing. And how, then how, how was that? Like the part that I saw of it, uh, it kind of peeled back the curtain on what, campaigns yep. actually look like yep. and, and like the emphasis on money and raising money yep. and how much time you spend on the phones yep that was yeah that was and stuff and like you know people think running for office would be some glamorous like oh, on God. a stage but they don't and yeah. you kind of peel back the curtain yeah you talk i mean that a was the point because i was like it, so i agreed to do it in the first place because i thought that you know i don't know if i'm gonna win 
but I want this to mean something. I want this to have some kind of an impact. And if nothing else, I feel like people need to know what it's actually like to, you know, what politics is actually like and, and what it means to get elected and, and how people go about doing that, because that's the only way we're going to change things if people actually understand it. Um, and so you, despite the, the, you know, better judgment of my consultants and advisors, um, I said, no, I want to do this. And then it stuck, like they did the 15 minute episode, but they're like, we want to turn this into a longer thing if you'll let us keep following you. And so we're like, I was like, fine. And, you know, I said, I was just very, if open nothing else, like, yeah, I've been very just open and, tra yeah. you know, transparent. I think that um, probably, you know, in some cases <laughs> to my detriment, but um, I think that that's a, that was a really important piece for me was being able to just you know, show that this is, this is what it's like. And these are the problems with it. And this is why regular people are so rarely able to make it, um, into politics at all, let alone into, you know, the highest levels of government like Congress. Um, so I don't have any regrets on that front, you know? Yeah. Um, so you get up there, we're both swarming in, in January, 2019. Um, obviously green, very new and everything's that we talked about a little bit by this last night. Everything's kind of a shock yeah. uh, when you get up there and figure out how, uh, how things operate, trying to figure out how to get your office to the house yeah. floor, uh, in the tunnels and everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, what were kind of some of the realizations you had being up there and the differences between like fact and fiction as to how it operates or. Well, I think. Between fact and fiction. I mean, I guess just some of it is that like, or what would people be surprised like if they're listening now to like find out? Oh, well, that's how it works, or that's that that's what goes on, or yeah. that's that's only on House of Cards, uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, shoot, House of Cards is way more real than <laughs> I think I ever would have predicted. You could have but... scripted this last. You could have scripted <laughs> no. the 116th Congress. No. Like, For... if you had taken it that producer, they'd be like, no, no, that's way that's too crazy. Way too yeah. crazy. You need to tone down a little bit. <laughs> no, I think um, I think one of the things that surprised me, one of the big things that surprised me is was that. I felt like as a really young person and as a, as a freshman that we were taken a lot more seriously than I was expected um, by the people who had been there for decades and the people who, you know, were in leadership. Uh, power is certainly concentrated in leadership, but I think that, you know. Pretty top heavy. Yeah, very top heavy, but I was in leadership. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was the freshman representative and, um, and that was. So you were part of the problem. No, no. <laughs> I know. No, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, the whole, the whole concept behind my campaign was like to, it was, was kind of like, I'm not a politician, but I'm going to, I'm going to go there and try and get into these places yeah. and try to, to make a difference. But, um, but yeah, I, I felt, I felt a lot more respect and, um, you know, like you, you were able to have influence and, um, on you know some of these people that i i just figured it was going to be a much tougher wall to break through yeah. uh but i also i had all these hopes and dreams of bipartisanship and being able to work across the aisle and that was damn near impossible um you know i just think that that the, those were those opportunities were or few and far between very few and far between very, very, and over the course of our congress i think we um we saw that get even worse and I mean, you know yeah, I mean, you established some good relationships with Republicans, though. Mm. Um, you know, we, we both worked across the aisle. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah. I don't know how prevalent that is now. I mean, I think that yeah, we're not up there. We weren't up there for the January sixth, but you got to think that that put a a big old damper on yeah, it. Yeah, damper on that. Yeah, right? I think so. I. I mean, I mean, you know, for a while, I was I was friends with Matt Gates. You know, mm. in in the sense that we were on the same committee and we we would banter and um. You know, but like once the election happened and he started going all in on this fraud stuff and then, you know, obviously January 6th happened. It's like, how are you supposed to even have a friendship at all when you're kind of like living on different yeah. levels of reality? You, you think there's a disconnect or, or they, that, that some of those people who are clamoring, you know, stolen election that they don't realize the level of culpability they have in inciting that violence. You think that there's just that disconnect there or, I think or do they, they, do they realize, is it realized that it just doesn't matter? I don't know. I honestly, I wonder that. I wonder if, you know, how do, how do you sleep at night? Um, I think that they, 
they must not there at least there has to be a big chunk that doesn't realize it and i think that there's also a big chunk that is honestly like well the people were pissed you know what i mean and and like they're they're, they're, what, they're reacting to public opinion as opposed to leading oh for leading sure out. but also i think that they're in some ways they justify it they say well the violence shouldn't have happened but i don't think that they're as I don't think that they're as outraged by the whole thing as we are. You know, I don't think that they saw it as an attack on the, the, the fundamental difference between, between Republicans and Democrats, if you really boil it down, is one party believes in government and the other one does not and really, really doesn't, you know, fundamentally think that those institutions need to be in place or at least need to be in place in, in any meaningful way. And some of them have there for 30, 40 years. Right, I know. Collecting the government paycheck, yeah, yeah, saying exactly. how there shouldn't be the government. Yeah, exactly. But, but we can address the irony of that later. I know. But, you know, I think when that's the case, you you just, it's it's very hard to find some common ground because, it, you know, if you do, if you try to do something that's helpful, then it goes against this concept of trying to kind of undermine government to make people not believe in it. And um, that was the part that I, I really, you know, I thought being on armed services, which is historically one of the most bipartisan committees, um, when I saw that, you know, bipartisanship for the Republicans really only means if Democrats will do stuff that they want to do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, you know, when Democrats are in power, then they're going to yeah. cooperate, um, you know, because the NDAA had to pass on like almost completely party and lines. Traditionally, the, for, for people who yeah. listen, the NDAA is the military budget yeah, it's, for all intents and purposes. Yep, it's the defense authorization, and it's always been bipartisan. Yeah, strongly bipartisan. But this time we were, you know, we were the majority, and the people in the majority kind of, you have, you have more influence and, um, and, you know, so finally we put in some things like changing the rules at Guantanamo and reducing the spending on some of these, you know, these pieces that like reducing the number of nukes, you just don't need as many nukes as we've got. And it, there were just some other things that should have been so obvious. Right. And, um, and they just wouldn't do it. They just wouldn't, they wouldn't even budge a little bit. And then it was that night it was, that I was just like, I don't, I don't, I think that this whole bipartisanship in in today's era mm -hmm. is it's not it's not there in the way that I really hoped because I, I grew up in a split household. My dad was a Republican. My mom was a nurse. I mean, well, she was a nurse, but she was a Democrat. And um, I think that there was I always had a sense that, well, there, you might disagree on, let's just say, defense or on, you know, social issues or on whatever, but that there there was a fundamental belief in like what's right yeah. you know and i i just i didn't even i don't think we're there right now and i hope that that changes over time as you know trump is out of office longer and maybe his grip on um public opinion starts to kind of lessen but i, I have a feeling that's gonna that's gonna be a long way in the future i remember when we were voting on the i think it's the cares act one of the first covid bills and trump still hadn't signaled whether he agreed or disagreed and the vote was scheduled for that night. And I'm going down the elevator in my office building with a few Republicans. And I was like, where are you guys coming down on this vote tonight? You know, it, it, here it, it's, it's on deck. Like, are y'all going to support it or not? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, from them was basically, we're waiting to hear from Trump. Yeah. And th that's just like, it, it was so mind boggling to me how like you couldn't make your decision based upon your political principles or your concerns for your constituents you're solely just waiting for a signal a signal mm -hmm. from the the president to say thumbs up or thumbs down yeah um and that you know like i said that i don't know it's just a, a different culture totally I different. Guess. and i don't i don't think it's been like that forever i think that trump no. trump really changed that and he still has this this presence that is, you know, pretty terrifying. It's not, it's not the same as a political leader. You know, when, when we've got Trump flags that are just it's everywhere. I feel like yeah. it's a personality. There's no, you know, you look at um, my, my predecessor, Mark, you know, Mark Sanford, he, he was, you know, uh, outspoken about, not even outside, I don't know if you say outspoken, but like he, he, didn't, he wasn't afraid to kind of stand up and say when he disagreed. And the disagreement may have been based on conservative principles. Um, but, you know, it was just a, a a matter of a purity test and a, and a loyalty test as mm -hmm. to whether or not Republicans could survive. Yeah. What, you know, not being loyal to uh, the conservative ideology, but loyalty right. to Trump himself. Yep. Yeah. So what the real question or the real test is going to be is in 2022, where the you know the the people who voted the the Republicans who voted for impeachment that Trump listed by name when he went to CPAC. Um, 
he's clearly going to hold that vendetta, right? Yeah. Like he's he's going to stick to that. The question is how much power is he actually going to have and are they are they going to get primaried successfully? Um and you know, we'll it'll, that's yet to be seen. Um I hope I really do hope that that the fact that he's been kind of deplatformed um is going to make a difference, but you know, I also don't think that that's going to last. I'm sure I'm sure that he'll end up back on Twitter mm-hmm. and Facebook. So, Katie, for those, you know, listeners who may not be familiar with with your store and your time in Congress, like you give everybody kind of an overview. You know, you, you like I said, you came in one of the we came in in mm-hmm. one of the biggest freshman classes mm-hmm. in, in, mo- in modern time. history. Right. Yeah. Well, for Democrats. Yeah. yeah. And, um, um, it's, you know, very we entered in. I, I like to say that our predecessors gave us a nice welcoming present. The government <laughs> shut down. Yeah. So walk into that. And then, uh, obvi- you know, obviously it was, is a pretty hectic session for everyone, but mm-hmm. you know, tell the folks who are listening, like kind of your, your view, what you went through and kind of where you are here today. Yeah. So, um, I've had a, a rocky couple of years. Um, so I got in, uh, my campaign, even though it was very well documented, um, I had a lot of personal stuff, you know, going on at the same time. I had, I had been in a, a not good marriage for quite some time, and it got worse over the course of the campaign, a lot worse. Um, and I tried, I actually, it had gotten so bad that I tried to leave in October, right before, I mean, you know, this what, 2019, no, 2018, 2018. I, oh, yeah. I, yeah. like, so a month before the election, a month before the election. So you can imagine like yeah. how crazy of a time that is. So the, the prospect of leaving at that point was, was insane. But so I try, I, I left at that point, but, and then my, um, my now ex-husband said that if I left, he would ruin me. And, um, and I, I said, I, you know, I, I ultimately decided I needed to go back because the, the stakes for the election, the consequences, like mine really could have been one of the top, you know, we didn't know it how many bigger, seats we were going to win. It was bigger than you. It was a you're, lot bigger. You're probably thinking like this yeah, is much bigger. Yeah, I mean, bigger if we did, if you're, flip, you're flipping a seat, yep. potentially flipping the house. Yep. Providing checks and balances. Yep. Like, so. Yeah. So it, it didn't feel like it was, yeah, it was. That's uh, weighing on you then. Totally. And so I went back and, but I knew that that wasn't, I wasn't going to be able to stay like that for very long. And so, um, you know, I went into Congress. And, uh, about six months later, I was like, I need, I need to leave for real. And so I did. Um, and I knew at that point what I was risking. I knew that my, my ex could, you know, he had pictures, he had, you know, whatever he had. And, um, and, but I was hoping that he wouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. Like I was hoping that 15 years would of being together would actually like, I mean, I met him when I was 16 years old. So, um, but eventually he decided to um, to basically put out photos and they got to um, Republican operatives. The, the woman who wrote the article, quote unquote, article that first leaked the photos was uh, she was she had been a campaign manager for one of my Republican opponents. Mm-hmm. And she was, you know, literally the day after it, you know, it all broke. She was like, if you want to get rid of Katie Hill, vote for Mike Garcia, you know, Mike. I mean, it was, it was just yeah. wild that it was this partisan. There's, yeah. you know, a lot Completely of stuff. transparent. Oh yeah. And, um, but I mean, I was, it was revenge porn, right? Yeah. Like revenge porn was used and, and ultimately, um, I decided because I had, I had a relationship with someone who had worked on my campaign mm-hmm. and that was exposed in the course of these, you know, all of these revelations. And I thought, you know, that the right thing to do at that point, because of all the stuff that was going on in Congress, the fact that I had a leadership position, the fact that, you know, this was getting such crazy attention, um, that the right thing for me to do would be to step away. Um, and you know, I, I decided to resign in October. No. Yeah. I guess that Halloween was the day that I resigned. Um, and, but again, I thought, I thought that a Democrat was going to be able to fill my spot. Um, the majority wasn't at stake anymore, right. but and Democrats had what a twelve vote cushion or something yeah, like that. Was, yeah, I can't remember what we had. To, whatever. Um, but yeah, we you know we did. Uh, it, did he, he the Republican, and the Republican won. won by how, how many points? Did he beat? Oh, in November he only won by three hundred and thirty votes. So, but the special that filled your special, he won by, I don't remember what yeah. percentage it was. It was big, much bigger than we thought. So that, that, that happened. Yep. And, but I said, you know, I said on my resignation speech that, you know, that kind of went viral that, you know, I'm basically, I'm, I might be gone for now, but I'm not gone forever. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to let this silence me. And so 
Um, I've kind of shifted my attention towards advocacy. I started a PAC called Her Time, which is, uh, is really focused on the issues, on advocating for the issues and electing women, um, that, advocating for the issues that specifically affect women more, and, um, and that, you know, to try and get more women elected. Mm-hmm. By providing that early support, that really early support that we know is so important to building a campaign that is hard to get, right? Like even the more established women's groups like Emily's List, they can't, they, they, just because of the sheer number, right. um, they're not able to offer that early support before you show quote unquote viability, which means money. Yeah. Um, but now, so we did, we, we've supported a lot of candidates this past cycle, um, but now in the off year, well, in the, you know. The legislative year, we're focusing on our legislative priorities, which include, you know, raising the w- minimum wage, which yeah. disproportionately affects women, equal pay, um, organizing, HR and one HR is one is yeah. a big one. And because, for, because of that exact same reason is that we have to level the playing field for, um, for us to ultimately achieve equal representation. So um, we're really ramping up on her time. I wrote a book called She Will Rise that published in August. Um, Started the podcast, so I've been You're staying. Busy. I've been staying busy. Yeah. You visit. You visited Charleston. I did. It's, I, a, it's another I, big milestone. I for did. You. I. I am like. I'm sure I'm going to get some help for going on a trip in COVID. But you know, I did. I did stay at an Airbnb and have yeah. been safe. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, well, t- talking about the, you know, I spoke about this last night, like HR one, which is, you know, the, something we both voted for, supported. Um, when we think about like what's wrong with DC, what's wrong with government. I, I take things back to like the rules of the game, mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. baselines and HR one seeks to change these rules to make it more of a, you know, to, to level the playing field, get dark money out of politics mm-hmm. and put things back into the voters hands. Yep. And one of the things we're, which is on HR one included is uh, independent redistricting, yep. which is the case in California, yep. right? Yep. So you have an independent redistricting. In yep. South Carolina, it's done by the state legislature, which is uh, controlled by Republicans. And, you know, yesterday I was showing you, like, the, it's driving down the district boundary, showing you, like, how, ridiculous how, it how is. cut up it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. We, see, we see the effects of, like, or we saw the effects of it up in Congress with the people who, you know, are from gerrymandered districts. And the only thing they're concerned about is winning the primary. Right. Right. They're Because... Regardless of, of, you think about somebody like, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but you know, there's, there's a, a Dan Crenshaw who is hit the surrounding area. His district's gerrymandered. Yeah. yeah his district's it, totally ger- gerrymandered, but his, the surrounding area is not, it's not this hardcore Republican yeah. space, but it, because of the way that it's drawn in Texas, which is also c- completely controlled by Republicans. Um, you know, he's totally safe. He can be as, as right wing fatty as he wants want. to be. And, um, and it's, he's not going to face any consequences. And so it really gerrymandering on both sides, whether it's democratic leaning or Republican leaning, it pushes people to the extremes. It forces you, um, as a, as a sitting member or somebody who's running to go far to the left or far to the right, because you have to win that primary. And, you know, you, I, I don't know how much you had to deal with it here. It might've been less, less so, but the primary I mean, I was criticized like crazy for having two moderative positions. And, you know, I think that that's, that's a real, that's a real problem. When, yeah. I mean, I don't even think my positions were particularly moderate, but, um, but like, I, I, I know that, you know, that's the we it, primaries, the way that they are, um, that the way that they're set in, especially in these gerrymandered districts, there's no way that we're going to get to the point where we have some kind of balance um, because it's just, it's just, it doesn't matter. This, the consequences are not there for people to actually have to um, to try to be reasonable than when they're you know pushed further and further to the sides. In California, you'll have what the jungle primaries yeah. basically, right? Yeah. So Democrats and Republicans are kind of lumped in there all together, and people choose the top two. Top two. Mm-hmm. And so it could be two Democrats, it could be two Republicans. Yeah. So like in be- in LA, for example, you always like L- most LA districts, it's always two Democrats that make it to November. Um, it's been plenty of times in, in my former district that two Republicans were the ones that made it to November. Um, it's a weird system. I, I can see the rationale for why they did it in the first place, but I don't know that it's the right answer. I think it also creates further, um, you know, partisanship, Yeah. but whatever. I mean, we're, we've got, we got a lot of problems and the top, the jungle primary one, I think is 
not the the top one. <laughs> I, I, I know when we talk about like uh, you know, we've been talking about our time up there, and I don't want to paint everything in in a bad light or depressing light, but talk about what were some of the highlights and and like some of the you know as you sitting here today thinking about reflect on your time up there, like what you're you know just kind of the, the memories you made that you kind of carry with you or yeah. friendships or relationships or yeah. Well, our class was was really incredible. The people yeah. we met, um, and I mean, it was it was a real very diverse, very like I very mean, cool people, like very real, accomplished people too. Yeah, so smart and just real. You know, I yeah. think that that all of well, I can't say all, but most of the people that we that we came in with, I just looked at them and I was like, these are the people that I would have been happy to vote for. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it didn't happen to be running in my district, but I wouldn't have felt the need to run if, if these were the ones that were, yeah. that were going to be representing me. Um, but, and, and so it felt so much like we were, and I still, and I still truly believe this. I think that, you know, there's always with any kind of progress, it's two steps forward, one step back. But I think we were at the front edge of a changing time in politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're, we're still seeing that. And it, it, we did take a step back this time. Um, that's why, you know, you and me and a lot of other people that should still be in Congress yeah. aren't, but I think that it's going to ultimately, it's going to keep going forward. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm, I'm excited about that, but the, you know, the people are probably the biggest, the biggest thing, but we really did, you know, we made history on a lot mm -hmm. of, a lot of the votes that we took. Um, HR one is an example, but the equality act and, and yeah. so many more, we passed that for the first time through Congress yeah. during ours. And, and the fact that we did made it so that it had to pass. It, it basically had to pass this year when there's an actual chance of it going to the yeah. Senate. And that means that the next time when it's a bigger, you know, Senate majority, hopefully yeah. that it's going to pass again. And, and it had, we had to be the ones to make, to make kinda, that initial kinda, break. Yeah. And some people say, well, you know, it didn't go anywhere with the Senate, HR one or other bills, but people, I think it's easy to overlook that. This sets a marker. It does set a marker for for the, for the future yep. and, and sets a precedent that these things are achievable and yep. stuff. Yeah, and that you know it starts to create an expectation of public support, and um, that's I think the the real the real thing that we've got to continue to push yeah. is, uh, and and that's why I think people people's education around politics and it and uh, you know involvement in civics like all of that is. Uh, is critical for us to be able to actually make some progress because, it, you know, literally we're not going to be able to make these changes without public opinion. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that that's kind of our calling now and our charge is like, what are we, each of us who's not in Congress who, you know, and I don't think, I think most of us went there never thinking that we were guaranteed to go back. Right. 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 Um, but I mean, your district first Democrat and I mean you're thirty, 30 years, 30 yeah. years mm -hmm. ours first one in like forty years. Yep. Some of them never seen. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we were obviously we were redistricted pretty differently from before, and it was so the current version of the district. There'd never been a Democrat. Yeah. Um, when it, when it was a Democrat previously, it had had a big chunk of LA, yeah. and that's obviously not the case now. So I think that there's yeah we politics changes very frequently and um we know that there's not there's not we we knew that there wasn't a stability and so it kind of forced us to how much can we how much change can we make now right um and how much can what we do set a precedent for the future and and can the fact that we made it in the first place make other people think that they can do it and mm -hmm. i think that those those actually that happened and so now for all of us who aren't there you know, what are we doing to continue to advance that? Maybe that's running for running for our seats again. Maybe that's running for something else. Maybe that's, you know, advocacy. Um, and I don't, I think we're all probably in the, pro the, the process of still figuring that out. Yeah. I don't know about you, but yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I think we go through life, uh, that way, that yeah. way with, with everyone, like trying to figure out the best, you know, the best move, the best impact you can make mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, judging from there. Um, yeah. But I mean, the, 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 I don't know, I think back to the freshman class, like I know that the line share of the attention gets put on, you know, Alex or mm -hmm. the, the other members of the squad. But the mm -hmm. fact remains like there are a lot of dynamic people and oh, like, yeah, and so the many. women, you know, in, in, in our class too, like I, I tell people, I feel like I'm much showing up to like a pedigree contest. Like, <laughs> like, you know, um, I'm in there, you know, we had Abigail Spanberger yeah. as one of our first guests on the show. 
Um, you know, Mike, Mikey Sher- Cheryl, a, a helicopter pilot. Yeah. So um, impressive. Just all, just Susie all so Lee, impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, Lauren Underwood, mm-hmm. you're your r- roommate, mm-hmm. uh, a nurse and just, um, so many people with incredible stories though. Yeah. And we, we probably lowered the average age but, uh, of we a did. member of Congress by, by 40 de- years. Yeah, I think, right? I can't remember. We, we actually did lower the average age by over a decade, um, with our class yeah. and that's, it's a big deal. So I think I, I really do think that we had an impact, and we're going to continue to have an impact. Yeah. And um, I think I think of us as as a as a new generation of of leaders, um, and I think that that means that we've we've opened doors for other people yeah. to to follow. So kind of kind of set the example that hey, hey you know you don't have to uh, have a career in politics yeah. to, to run for something like exactly. this. You know, all you need is that passion and the um, something to drive you to 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 change the status quo. Yeah. Um, I know that, you know, and going back to what happened on January 6th, a common question I get, I'm sure you do too. Like, aren't you glad you weren't up there, you know, or do you, you know, do you miss it, miss it? And that's kind of my question to you. Yeah. Like, like are the days you wake up where like, I wish I was up there in the fight or in mm-hmm. the mix or anything? Yeah. I mean, so January 6th, I, I mostly where, where were you stay, that day anyway? Yeah. I mostly stay in DC. So I was just, you know, a mile away from it. Okay. And, um, I, uh, as I'm watching it, I'm watching it on the TV. I'm watching the crowd go to, you know, literally watching Trump tell them to march to the Capitol and mm-hmm. seeing like these blockades are not going to keep these people away. Right. And um, just thinking like, you know, I was texting friends that we had there and just being like, who are, who are hold, uh, hold up yeah, there, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And former staff, former like- staff, check, just checking on them and, um, and saying to be safe and everything. And then once they broke through, just like, like you're just you're helpless, right? Yeah. You're helpless to be able to even know if the people that you care so much about are are safe and okay. And meanwhile, you're seeing this this institution that you grow to respect even yeah. more when you're there, right? Um, like it a horrible scene, right? We all saw it. We all were affected by it. But and you you see these like I think for Americans in general is personal because this is the heart of our democracy. If you'd work there and if you have friends, colleagues, or staff that's up there too. It's even it's, more so. It's, yeah, it's on a deeper level. Yeah. You see the shot on CNN or Fox, and you're like, oh, that's where so-and-so works. That's, and that's, you know. that's where I would walk every day yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and so I, would, I was um, – that day was actually probably the, f- the first – well, it wasn't the first, but it was, it was one of the, the biggest days for me where I felt like I should be there, yeah. right? Like I should be there to carry on the fight. and. And, you know, I've... Who are you talking to? Are you texting any other colleagues of ours? Oh, I was texting a bunch of our... Yeah, Yeah. a bunch of our colleagues. But, you know, obviously, we were a little distracted while they were in there. But I was texting them, you know, afterwards. And it's just... Yeah, it was just like... It just felt... It just felt like one of those things where, you know... For me, I... um, You know, I know that what I am able to... what Or am, was, whatever, able to bring to the table... Uh, to in terms of doing good is just it's a lot better than what my um, successor is and I'm sure you feel the same way yeah. and uh, and so that is a tough thing to swallow and I and and a lot of people were saying like oh, I'm so my, my family right like they were saying I'm so glad you weren't there and I can see that but that was actually a day where I felt like I should have been there and mm-hmm. I don't know how you felt but that was you know on a on a personal safety level you sh- yeah of course you don't want to be there but right. But in terms of like the calling or whatever, I mean, it felt it, yeah. it's it's not a stretch to imagine that if our colleagues who are Democrats had been identified by this group, they would have been no. they probably been killed. Yeah, I mean, um, especially like AOC this mob and, mentality, like yep, yeah. and and the speaker, like you know, the these women especially have been so vilified by the right-wing media that, you know, and they're tiny, right? Like Nancy and, Pelosi. And, and, is- and these, yeah. And these people, you know, uh, Speaker Pelosi and others in leadership get some f- form of uh, security. security, but like no one else does. No. Right. Nope. Alex, and- Alex, Ilhan, Rashida, these recognizable faces that have been, you know, pointed out as enemies that yeah. people have, that, that people have really internalized as these dangers or these just, yeah. What, whatever however however they've been painted like I, I mean it was a freaking lynch mob and they're notice that they were women right yeah, like all of the yeah. ones that were and it started long before january oh, 6th yeah, as long well, before. right i mean i, I remember we have i was so that was one of the things that as as a freshman group 
we like we pushed for um i can't remember when the death threats were getting big uh against the squad right, Alex and a few, yeah they were const- oh, constantly yeah but we were pushing for extra security for them yeah. and i don't think that they ever got it um i think they got it for like a little bit when the threats were really high yeah but it was not it was not did you get a lot of death threats i got plenty yeah, yeah. um but i but mine was i had a few that were serious enough that they had to get like investigated and, and everything like that but um and especially after like Pre- i got nasty stuff after the pictures came out as yeah. you, i'm sure you can imagine but um but yeah not not nearly as bad as as you know it's really those four right yeah, like it's, it's right. those are the ones that that got targeted the most so and it is interesting and not interesting but messed up that they are women of color mm-hmm. and that the the fact that the people who are most vilified are are women like the you know speaker pelosi has been the one who's taken this heat for so long Mm -hmm. um and now you know there's there's more there are new faces that are taking it too but um it's just something for us to to think about like why is it that the villains are women and and are in particular women of color well we tried to like you know impress on people that words matter in such a day and age where folks kind of are drawn to their own rabbit holes on Facebook Mm -hmm. or Twitter and, you know, they can reinforce any beliefs that they have, whether it be the election was stolen or whatnot, but like you can't just, and when you have elected officials who may amplify a certain belief or derogatory comments, um, sometimes those fall upon ears of people that are not mentally sound and that, and that provides a lot of like fodder or ammunition for these people who, who can and, 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 you know, sometimes do, uh, carry out. Yeah, on these, I mean, we were talking threats. about that with like Dylan Roof, right? Like yeah. the, the the extremism is bred through the internet and through right. the you know the platforms have no accountability, and that's actually something that I'm working on too. Um, but there's the you know the algorithms are set up in a way so that the most salacious stuff is what you know you're presented with, right? What everyone's presented mm-hmm. with, and it's it's that rabbit hole is literally, you know, it's, it's just a hole that you're sucked into that makes people more and more extreme and exposes yeah. them to these crazier and crazier conspiracy theories. And, um, and I, I, you know, we're, we're going to have to reconcile that. Like it is a huge problem. This yeah. disinformation, this QAnon stuff, it's, it's literally tearing apart our democracy. Right. right. And, um, until we get to the bottom of, of how do we stop that? And, and I, the first amendment to me has been weaponized um, mm. because there's got to be some kind of a line where. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you know, the saying is you can't, you know, even the freedom of speech doesn't allow you to scream fire in a crowded theater. And, you know, this, this whole notion of cancel culture is coming up. The f- folks who feel like they've been silenced on social media. And, you know, there's also the saying, you know, you're entitled to your own opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. When your rhetoric is weaponized or it leads people encourages people to to take up violence i mean that those forms of speech are, are not, not protected no uh, well and and they're gonna it's gonna be litigated because like there's this is we're in a new era you know we're mm-hmm. in we're in a, a space where we've we're seeing this stretched and with technology we're seeing the definitions of speech be stretched um and i don't you know, I don't think that we're going to have a real answer to this for a while. I think it's going to have to go to the through the courts. I think it's going to go to the Supreme Court. And my my case, my my civil case, is you know, it's it's one of those where. So can you, can you talk about the the context of that, or like what legal question is at stake there? With yeah, that? I mean the the legal question that is being asked basically is where does quote unquote freedom of speech, um, you know, how, how far does that extend to? And the argument that we're making is that it doesn't extend, regardless of you being a public figure, it never extends to photos that are uh, uh, non-consensual photos of, you know, that are related to your sexual privacy. Um, revenge porn is, is and never should be a form yeah. of protected speech. And that's something that I'm committed to fighting because it's not just, it's not just me. It's some, it's, this is what happens to women and men um, constantly across mm-hmm. the country every single day. And there's not, there are not, it's, people don't have the resources to be able to pursue this legally and the same way that I'm, you know, committed to doing. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's the fourth amendment privacy, uh, questions of privacy versus the first amendment. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's this question of, of 
really where where does that line get drawn? And it's only one of many spaces, but ours in particular is about naked pictures right. are not something that can be protected under free speech. Yeah. Plain and simple. Um, and, but that's actually going to have to be ruled on, you know, that's going to have, we're going to have to go through, and I'm sure that we're going to have to have a whole bunch of appeals, whether, regardless of who wins in the first place right now. So it's in the stage where, um, the, so we filed our complaint and all the defendants filed what's called an anti-slap motion, meaning that their motion, their motion is to dismiss the lawsuit just on the basis that they're saying that our law, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a first, it's a first amendment thing. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's just going to be an uphill battle and, um, you know, trying to pass laws is, an, it, you know, has to happen at the same time. So that's what we're working on. A lot going on for you, Katie. Yeah, just, you know, a little bit. And a movie in the works too, right? Yeah. Okay. So the, the movie, the, the movie is, I, I sold the rights to my book. Right. Um, she will rise. The first book. The first book, yeah. Are you releasing a second one? Or uh, it's, I'm, or I'm process, working on or? one. I have not. Yeah, it's, it's early stages, though, okay. still for the second one. Right. But the first one, um, which published in August, I sold the rights to a movie um, to Blumhouse, which is uh, the, you know, the production company. And, uh, and so, you know, it's going to... They, they pass on ours, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> them and Vice. You got to write the book the and then sell the rights to the book, okay, you know? Right. So you got to do that first, right. but... Um, but you know, I mean like the, it's, it's really interesting when you're talking about selling it, it makes it sound like, oh, you sold, you're sold the rights to your book for a movie. It's like, oh, well, all that money is going to go straight to legal fees on this. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's hard to think about like, um, it ain't making me rich. That's yeah. for sure. But, um, I'm not going to have, I'm not going to be like an executive producer on the movie because we want to try and maintain some level of, you know integrity with the topic it's a tough topic it's one that's not the to, to try and cover comprehensively um i want to maintain some distance from it so, so any idea on the timeline on like when that um i think movie, best yeah. case scenario it would it would probably come out late next year okay um but whenever movies start coming out yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah yeah so we'll see um you know it's they sorry <laughs> Sounded like a my, guitar. Yeah, it did. It sounded like a guitar string. My my the foot hit the mic stand yeah. here. Yeah, no, I was I was pretty sure there was yeah. a ghost guitar happening yeah. somewhere. Um but sound, yeah. sound effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our outro music. Exactly. Um but yeah, I mean it's Hollywood is a weird is a weird place right now. And um there's just so many there's just so many things where you're just like, well, I'm gonna have all these balls in the air and hope that something yeah. sticks. Yeah, a lot of lines and lines yeah. in the water. Yeah. Um we start to wind things down. Um, one of the questions we ask everybody who comes on our show uh, is, you know, if you were to sit down and have a beer and a discussion with somebody in history, whether it be dead or alive, who would that person be and why? And I'll say, I'll preface it by saying we get a lot of interesting answers uh, okay. from from folks. Um, just the, the notion of, like I said, sitting down and conversing with someone, hearing other person's perspectives. Um, so, so I'm. So when I, I knew that you asked this question and I thought about it and then, and then I was like, I don't know if this is a good answer or not. Um, I'll be the judge of that. Okay, cool. But, <laughs> but like for some reason, then the person that kept coming back to me is, is Joan of Arc. Really? <laughs> I don't think she was a drinker, but yeah, like, yeah. but like that's she when. She watch you drink though. Yeah. Yeah. But like, I'm like, man, someone who's just, or, or like one of the Salem witches, you know, yeah. like just this, this persecution piece, like, I don't know. I feel like there's there's just so much that you could learn from that and and obviously like how are we going to talk about like what I'm going to I'm just going to assume that if you're having a beer with a spirit that yeah. they have had a a life beyond the grave right. and you know so for somebody who's been dead for centuries how how they look back on these things like that would be a pretty fascinating yeah. discussion so well and yeah, and, and what their take would be on on the progress everything that's now. been made mm-hmm. and, and everything, like, because like while there's been a lot of progress, there's still remains, long way to go. Yeah, mm-hmm. long ways to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and as you know, we're I know that this isn't going to come out for a few days, but we're talking on International Women's Day, and it's a um, that's a really important question for us to be asking. Is you know just looking back on where things were a century ago, we we have come so far, and yet not not nearly far enough. And, um, you know, how can we celebrate success? And we should, 
but still recognize the work that has to be done. Yeah. Um, so excited you made it to Charleston. Yeah, thank and, you. And come through here. Welcome again, Charleston. I hope you all come back. Yeah. I um, want well, thank you for coming on Joint Resolution. Absolutely. And, and so you'll have to come on Naked Politics. That's it. So, so putting a plug here, I forgot. the So your podcast, Naked Politics. Um, Sounds like you said naked. Naked. <laughs> ne- that, That's a very, how you said what? very southern. Naked. Yeah. How you, how you say it? Naked. 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 <laughs> All right, naked, 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 naked politics. Naked politics. Um, God, now you throw me off here. All right, uh, here, plug your podcast. You know, go with it, Katie, for for the listeners. So, uh, naked politics podcast. You can find it wherever you find uh, wherever you find your podcasts. Um, It's (laughs) <laughs> it's not spelled n-e-k-k-i-d <laughs> <Nick>. <laughs> just n-a-k-e-d yeah. um but it's uh i have i was talking to you about this yesterday like i have been a little bit more intermittent with mine I, yeah. and and now you're making me feel like i need to step up my step up my game um but i you know the the point of that podcast too is to just kind of go behind behind the curtain mm-hmm. and expose every bit of it that we can so um when you come on, we'll 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 get real. Awesome. Does that mean I have to come to L.A. then? No, or, okay. no, no. I'll, we can or we DC can do it. or we should come to D.C. just to visit. But uh, yeah. but you know, since it's apparently only an hour and fifteen minute flight, I know that that chapped that chapped you for some reason. I was telling you that. Oh my, yeah. My, my, my commute time between you're like you you did that in a single day to go to work and yeah, LA. I would drive an hour and fifteen minutes to go to work in L.A. and the the commute for members of Congress from L.A. is you know it's a six hour flight it's, it's brutal i don't you know i don't especially folks who are from swing districts mm-hmm. where you, you had to get back every oh, yeah, weekend you're going back every week and be out and about be seen be working yep. and um where certain people yeah you know, you're in a safe, pro- seat, yeah, you're in a safe like, seat you don't you don't leave like no. th- you know i doubt swallow goes back every weekend oh it doesn't have to um, i mean and and you know truthfully we know this like the stuff that you do in the districts a lot of the time is like for appearances more than like you're not needed in terms of the work that you're accomplishing by people want to see they their, want to see their you representative yep. and their member like yeah. you know yeah so um, but yeah i mean it's not it's just not a long-term sustainable thing to go from california and to dc every single week for yeah. you know twice a week forever but anyway Yes, you should come. You should come visit in DC now. Yeah, that's roundabout ways. Right. Yeah. I'm gonna come on your podcast yeah, yeah, yeah. too, right? But, you, okay. but we, we don't. You don't have to come okay. in person. Yeah. So, uh, well, want to remind folks uh, to follow us uh, on Facebook, Twitter at Joe Cunningham SC. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on either on Spotify or or Apple or wherever you get your podcast. And um, I want to say thanks to my my friend, yes, and colleague Katie Hill, for for coming on. Thank and, you and so much. And fun. cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Appreciate it. I think you still got a little bit left in yours, but um, clink. I'm like clink. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and people can follow me on Twitter too. That's right. Go ahead, plug for hot takes uh, at Katie Hill, the number four CA. Katie Hill at Katie Hill four CA. Yep. Gotcha. And there we have it. All right. Yeah. Well, until next time, I'm Joe Cunningham, and I yield back.